You're watching Reason and Theology, a Catholic show dedicated to defending the Catholic faith and evangelizing non-Catholics. Protestant preacher Justin Peters recently teamed up with Mike Gendron, a former Catholic and now Protestant evangelist, to do a video critiquing Catholicism. The title of the video is Answering Catholic Objections with Mike Gendron. It's a lengthy video and it would take a very long time to address point by point, so I will limit myself to select highlights only. In the following clip, we will see a criticism of priestly celibacy. Let's take a look. Um, Mike, why do why does the Roman Catholic Church not allow priests to be married? You've already read 1 Timothy 4.1. Uh, some will fall away from the faith uh, and pay heed to deceit, deceitful, deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons. Uh, why does the Roman Catholic Church not allow priests to be married when um, Scripture says that one of those doctrines of demons is forbidding marriage? What's going on there? At the outset, I should point out that the Catholic Church does have married priests. It always has been a tradition to have a mix of married priests and celibate priests in the Eastern churches. This tradition is preserved in the Eastern Catholic churches, where we have many married priests. Even in the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, though priestly celibacy is the normal discipline, there are dispensations granted, which allows for some married men to also serve as Latin rite priests. In other words, mandatory priestly celibacy is a discipline in the Latin rite only, and one which allows for exceptions. Next, I will note that 1 Timothy 4.3 is not about the Latin rite discipline of priestly celibacy. After all, the first epistle to Timothy had to make sense to the readers of the first century, at which time there was no such thing as a Latin rite, let alone mandatory priestly celibacy for this rite. There was an apostolic encouragement and preference of celibacy, as we see in St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but there was no strict mandate for Latin rite priests. In other words, 1 Timothy 4.3 is not about the later discipline of priestly celibacy for certain rites in the Catholic Church, and to suggest that it is, as Peters and Gendron do, is anachronistic to say the least. So what is 1 Timothy 4.3 about? Even Protestant commentators recognize it is about Gnostics who were not suggesting priestly celibacy, but were opposed to marriage entirely. The interpreter's one-volume commentary on the Bible says, quote, this is undoubtedly a reaction to Gnostic tendencies towards asceticism in the church, end quote. It was the Gnostics who believed the material world was evil, so they forbade marriage as a matter of principle, not as a discipline for a select group of people. Is the Catholic Church in the Latin Rite today, like the Gnostics, opposed to marriage entirely? Is it forbidding people to marry? This would be hard to maintain considering some of the sacraments of the Catholic Church. In fact, one of them is the sacrament of matrimony. In the Latin Rite, every person has the right to marry. It's merely that if you wish to become a priest in the Latin Rite, you would ordinarily need to exercise celibacy. But ordination candidates for the Latin Rite are free to discern that the priesthood is not for them and are then able to pursue another vocation and enter into a marriage at that time. Next, let's listen to the former Catholic Mike Gendron on why the Latin Rite has a discipline of priestly celibacy. Well, follow the money. Uh, if you look at church history, the priests were becoming very wealthy. And so when they would die, the wealth that they obtained would go to their wife. And so the Catholic Church put an end to that, and they actually forbid priests to marry. And so it is a doctrine of the devil, as we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1. And so that is uh, ultimately, again, if you study the history of the Catholic Church, you will see that this huge amount of wealth had come into the Catholic Church. And a lot of it had to do with selling God's forgiveness through indulgences. And so many of the priests and bishops and cardinals became very wealthy we know that a lot of the money went to build the Basilica at St. Peter's. And so the church put an end to that now. And my uncle was a Roman Catholic priest. And so um, I know firsthand, uh, even though my uncle didn't have a lot of money, he spent 30 years in the jungles of Burma converting the Burmese to Roman Catholicism. But he did acknowledge that uh, they were forbidden to marry. And he wouldn't admit that that was the reason. But 
again, all you can do is look at church history and see. It's interesting that Mike doesn't provide any sources for his claims. He alludes to a time period in the high Middle Ages where some members of the clergy amassed wealth and claims that priestly celibacy derived from the church's greed to inherit this wealth rather than passing it on to the family of a deceased member of the clergy. Is this true? Was this really the reason why the Latin Rite practiced priestly celibacy? As early as the Western Councils of Ancyra in 314 AD and also Neo Caesarea in the same year, the Western Church was passing canons requiring priestly celibacy in its territories. Was money a factor here? It's hard to suggest that it was, since priests in this period were more likely to be persecuted by the Roman Empire than to amass wealth. There is simply no evidence that priests in this period were amassing a great deal of wealth, and the evidence we do have seems to suggest otherwise. Why then was priestly celibacy exercised in the Western churches? 1 Corinthians 7, 33-34 sheds some light on this question. It says, A married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can she please her husband? In other words, when someone is married, they are divided between their marriage and ministry. However, a minister who is celibate is able to devote their time entirely to ministry. For this reason, the Western Church found it to be more advantageous to require celibacy of its clergy. One might question whether this discipline is ideal, as some Eastern Catholics certainly do. But one may not use false historical claims, like the ones we heard from Mike Gendron, in order to criticize it. Let's now take a look at the next clip. Okay, Mike, next one. Um, We as Protestants say to Catholics, Catholics, you put tradition over Scripture, or you elevate tradition at least to the same authoritative level as Scripture, if not over Scripture, Catholics say, no, we don't. Take it away. Sure. Well, the Catechism of the Catholic Church clearly states that Roman Catholics have three authorities, and they dare to say that all three are equal. And the three authorities would be the Word of God, which is the Bible, along with sacred tradition, and then the infallible teachings of the Pope. Now, they say they're all equal, but in actual practice, it is the magisterium of the church, which is made up of all the bishops of the church. They actually sit above scripture and tradition. And the Catholic Church will deny this, but it's the bishops who actually twist and distort scripture so that it conforms to the ungodly traditions in the Roman Catholic religion. And so the Apostle Peter probably not knowing what laid ahead. He said that those who pervert the word of God, they do it to their own destruction. And that's what Catholic bishops do. They distort the word of God so that it tries to harmonize with the traditions of the Catholic church. And so in actual practice, you've got the magisterium sitting above scripture and tradition, twisting and distorting the scripture so it conforms with their tradition. Catholicism does not say that all three of the authorities mentioned, Scripture, Tradition, and the infallible teachings of the Pope, are equal, as Mike Gendron claims. First, I think Mike Gendron poorly expressed himself when he conflated infallible teachings of the Pope with the Magisterium, which is the teaching authority of the Church. He does reference the Magisterium as the bishops in the Catholic Church, but to reduce the Magisterium to the infallible teachings of the Pope would be like reducing the human body to a thumb. The thumb is certainly part of the human body, but it's not the entire human body. Likewise, infallible teachings of the Pope are acts of the magisterium, but there are many other acts of the magisterium, like non-infallible acts of the Pope, infallible and non-infallible acts of ecumenical councils, the ordinary and universal magisterium, teachings of local councils, teachings of local bishops, and others. More importantly, Gendron does not give any proof for his claims. He merely asserts that the magisterium of the Catholic Church sits above Scripture. He rightly notes that Catholics will deny this, as the Second Vatican Council's document De Verbum in paragraph 10 says the following, This teaching office is not above the Word of God, but serves it 
teaching only what has been handed on, listening to it devoutly, guarding it scrupulously, and explaining it faithfully in accord with a divine commission, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, it draws from this one deposit of faith everything which it presents for belief as divinely revealed. But again, Mike Gingern rebuts this claim by asserting that the magisterium sits above Scripture and even says, perverts the Word of God to its own destruction. It is certainly easy to make such claims. In fact, I could easily retort that Mike Gendron perverts the Word of God and sits above Scripture with his own private interpretations of the Bible. However, merely making such claims is worthless. It would be persuasive, however, to demonstrate how Mike may do so if I were to make such a claim. Sadly, Mike does not provide us with any further evidence, so one has to simply shift the burden of proof back to his end. Let's look at another clip where Peters and Gendron claim that Catholics worship Mary. Okay, uh, so that leads us to, I guess, the person who would be at the uh, top of the pyramid of their, their saints would be Mary. Um, as Protestants, we say, Catholics, you worship Mary. And Catholics say, no, we don't. We do not worship Mary. We revere Mary, but we don't worship Mary. You know, you misrepresent what we believe about Mary. Talk to us about Mary. Well, first we have to explain what Catholics say they do. They venerate Mary. Now, if you look up venerate in Webster's Dictionary, it says to worship. But the Roman Catholic Church says that they worship only God. They only venerate Mary and the saints. And so... It's really just a play on words. It is worship. In fact, here Mike says Catholics claim they don't worship Mary, but only venerate her. But if you look up venerate in Webster's Dictionary, it says to worship, according to Gendron. When I look up venerate in Miriam Webster's Dictionary, it says to regard with reverential respect or with admiring deference. And for the second definition, it says to honor an icon or a relic with a ritual act of devotion. So Catholics are using the term venerate to mean honor, whereas Mike says otherwise. It is certainly true that English words have evolved over the years, and words like worship or venerate could be used interchangeably or even distinctly, depending on the time period and the context. But more importantly, the Catholic Church is larger than the English-speaking language. So if you want to know what Catholics believe about Mary, you would not go to a contemporary English word and then look it up in an outdated English dictionary. Rather, you would go to where the Catholic Church has officially spoken about its relationship towards Mary. If you look at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the Second Council of Nicaea, in the year 787, the Catholic Church teaches that it gives latria to God alone and hyperdulia to Mary. What do these terms mean today in contemporary English? Latria means what we call today worship, which the Catholic Church again gives to God alone. Dulia means honor. And hyperdulia means the highest honor. In other words, Catholics worship God alone, as the first commandment teaches us. But we give the highest honor that can possibly be given to a creature. And that then is given to the Virgin Mary. Why? Because she has had the most honored privilege of giving birth to the Son of God. No other creature can claim this honor. So does Gendron give any proof that Catholics worship Mary, or does he merely rely on unspecified versions of Webster's Dictionary? Let's take a look at the next clip to find out. It is worship. In fact, in my last newsletter, I showed a picture of um, the current Pope uh, before a statue of Mary, and he is very Marian in his theology. He really believes that Mary is a sinless mediator that Catholics can go through in order to receive the gift of salvation. In fact, that's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, that Mary is the cause of salvation, and she continues to bring us the gifts of salvation. In a lot of ways, they give her divine attributes. They won't go so far as to say she is the fourth person of the Trinity, but everything Christ is, they give a common title to Mary. They believe that Mary is the mother of God, and of course, that's an impossibility because for Mary to be the mother of God, she would have had to pre-exist the eternal God who had no beginning. No, Mary was the mother of Jesus Christ. And she was um, the mother of the Lord Jesus, and Jesus was both 
fully God and fully man, but it was the human nature that Mary um, gave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so she's not the mother of God. But um, I think Roman Catholics need to recognize that according to their catechism, the teachings on Mary go directly against the word of God. And I just mentioned several of them. Unfortunately, Gendron does not back up his claim with examples of how Catholics worship Mary. Instead, he shifts the discussion to claims that Catholics make about Mary. This seems to me like a subtle difference, but it is important. He does not provide any examples of acts of worship that Catholics offer to Mary. So his claims remain unsubstantiated, it would seem. But he does provide criticisms of what Catholics believe about Mary, such as his claim that the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, quote, Mary is the cause of salvation, end quote, which I assume is his way of saying Catholics are guilty of idolatry if the claim were true. But is this true? Does the Catechism actually say this? I can't find anything in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that says, quote, Mary is the cause of salvation. It would have been helpful if Gendred had provided a more specific source for his claim. But as we have seen so far, Mike doesn't seem to believe in the importance of substantiating his claims. Perhaps an audience sympathetic to his biases would forgive this. But those of us who would like to consider his claims more objectively, well, we might think otherwise. But back to the question, does the Catholic Church teach Mary is the cause of salvation? The Virgin Mary certainly played a role in the work of redemption. Insofar as she consented to give birth to the second person of the Trinity, who is the one that merited salvation for us. But is Mary the cause of salvation? In the way I suspect Gendron is using the word cause, the answer would be no. The Council of Trent is clear that it is Jesus who is the cause of our salvation in the sense that Gendron intends. It states in the session on justification, quote, But the meritorious cause is his most beloved only begotten our Lord Jesus Christ, who, when we were enemies for the exceeding charity wherewith he loved us, merited justification for us by his most holy passion on the wood of the cross, and made satisfaction for us unto God the Father. End quote. Nothing about Mary here. Why is that? Because her role in the work of redemption is not related to salvation in the way that Gendron has in mind, which seems to be the meritorious cause. This is why the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 970, can say, Mary's function as mother of men in no way obscures or diminishes this unique mediation of Christ, but rather shows its power. But the Blessed Virgin's salutary influence on men flows forth from the superabundance of the merits of Christ, rests on his mediation, depends entirely on it, and draws all its power from it. Gendron then shockingly claims that Mary is not the mother of God, but is the mother of Jesus. Martin Luther, the initiator of the Protestant Reformation, is rolling over in his grave at the moment. For Luther, the Virgin Mary is the mother of God. Luther rightly recognized that the denial that Jesus is the mother of God is an ancient heresy because it means the person Mary gave birth to is not the second person of the Trinity, a divine being. You will notice Gendron did claim that Jesus was fully God and fully human, but he then says Mary is the mother of Jesus because she gave birth to the human flesh of Jesus. It is certainly true that Mary gave birth to the human flesh of Jesus, but if one were to stop there, then they would actually be a heretic because she did more than that. Mary gave birth not just to a human nature, but to a divine person, the second person of the Holy Trinity. In other words, the one she gave birth to was fully human and fully divine. And so far as she gave birth to a divine person, it can be said that she gave birth to God. Nobody claims that the title, the mother of God, means that she gave birth to God in eternity past, which is what Gendron claims Catholics mean by the term. In fact, this is such an elementary blunder that one wonders how a former Catholic could make such a claim. In the end, there is no excuse for such a misrepresentation, and Gendron inconsistently sides with Christological heretics on this matter. As I said, there was much more that we could review from this video by Peters and Gendron, but this will need to suffice for now. If you have enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button. Don't forget to share this on your social media. Also hit that subscribe button and also check me out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. That'll do it for now. We'll see you later. God bless.